you ever wondered, can you communicate directly with spirit guides, teachers, or non-physical consciousness, or even our higher selves? What would they tell us? My name is Kevin Moore, and since 2015, I started to practice a form of communication which is termed channeling. I have been interviewing experts on my talk show to find out, does life continue after we die? And can we communicate with those that have crossed over? With each expert I spoke to, they all had different ideas. Is there knowledge from the past which could be shared with the present moment? So I thought, why not just speak to the non-physical world directly through channelers around the world? And that's what I set out to do. They call us channelers will take the viewers on a journey into the phenomena known as channeling. And my main goal with this docu-series is to bring a new understanding and awareness to channeling by looking within ourselves and asking, is it truly possible that we can all use this innate ability? Daryl Anker, welcome to the show. Thank you, Kevin. I appreciate you giving me this opportunity. Well, thank you for allowing me this opportunity to have you on. Um, I got to see you in action in person uh, at the channel panel this year, right. just a few days ago right now. A week, yeah, about a week. Yeah. A week ago. Um, you know, I, I've, never, I've, never got, I've never seen uh, uh, Daryl uh, um, prior to you know going under for um, Bashar, and, and it's it, it, it was fun. Yeah, yeah. It you know it's you treat it with a lot of laughter, which is nice. Yeah. Well, you know we don't take ourselves too seriously. We understand that the information can be profound, and that's fine. But um, you know I I have my own life to live, and therefore I don't really feel like anyone should be putting me on a pedestal. This is just what I do, and if it helps people, that's wonderful. Um, but, you know, it's just what I do. Absolutely. And, and how many years have you been bringing Bashar through? I've been channeling now for 34 years. That would make you on my journey probably one of the longest-running channels. Probably. I mean, there are some, I think, still around from the old days. But, yeah, I don't know many channels that have been channeling quite that long, maybe one or two. Did you meet any of the real older ones that you looked up to in the sense? I never had a chance to, unfortunately. It would have been nice to have met Jane Roberts, who channeled Seth. Oh, yes. Um, but no, unfortunately, I did not. And again, back in the beginning, even when this whole process started for me, I was familiar with the idea of channeling, but since it took a while for me to actually go into that world, um, those people had already gone on before I even got to the point where I considered myself to be a channel. Yeah, uh, I'm getting close to Jane Roberts in one sense that uh, Robert Butts' last wife, who's still alive, she potentially might be coming on this documentary. Okay. So that'll be interesting to have a survivor from that, that side right. to come on. Yeah, that would be cool. Yeah. Um, just to, you know, it would have been wonderful to meet Robert as well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the Seth material, it, so many people were influenced. Even Oprah Winfrey read the Seth material. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that, in my opinion, that's kind of the beginning of what I would consider the modern age of channeling. I mean, we talk in the documentary we did, First Contact, about a little bit about the history of channeling. And certainly it's been around for thousands of years, not necessarily by that name. Um, but I think Jane Roberts really kind of acted as a demarcation line, bringing the idea of channeling into our modern age. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. Um, you know, <clears throat> yeah, channeling, you know, would you say that all the prophets channeled? In a sense, yes. I mean, channeling is actually a very natural state. We all do it. Um, we just don't necessarily recognize that we're in that state. Uh, one of the things that we did in the documentary was specifically to demystify the concept of what channeling is as a state of mind, as a state of being. And so I actually had my head wired up to 
a brainwave machine, the EEG machine, during one of my channeling sessions so that we could see what is actually going on in a human brain when you go into that state. And we discovered some very profound differences are happening. But one of the main things we discovered is that it's literally what's called the gamma state. It's a particular frequency between 40 and 100 cycles per second in the brain. But when anyone is doing what they love to do, when they're in the zone, when they're in a deep meditation, they're actually in gamma, they're in a channeling state. So we all do it when in, we're in those moments of flow, but we don't necessarily know that we're in that state. And it's really just about deciding what to do with that state when you're in it, what drives you, what you're passionate about. Yes, that's, that's so true. And, and for me on this journey, meaning so many channelers, right? It's kind of said to me that, you know, what the channeling is to me is it's bring, bringing in the greater aspect of yourself yes. into this small funnel. It's, it's like if it was a funnel and, and, and it normally it's that greater aspect being forced into a, a smaller hole, right? Yeah, but it, yeah <laughs> I, I've, I've kind of sometimes um, defined it or described it as if I'm trying to get all of the water in Hoover Dam to come through a garden hose. Right. So, yeah, it's like this large very but just just large. Hoover, does the hoover dam open up a little bit when you do bring it well see it does or yeah. the garden hose stretches yeah yeah so yeah. i can bring more of it through so that's the process for the channel is in living your own life to the fullest as best as you can following the principles that bashar talks about and, and other channels talk about the channel stretches the channel becomes a better channel because you open up you can handle more information more energy more smoothly and deliver it in a much more uh coherent way so it, it, it works both ways. The more you practice it, the better you get at it, like anything. Yeah, absolutely. And, and let's, uh, there's so much to talk about with you in a very short time. So let's just bring in your backstory here as well, how sure. this happened. You were, uh, what was your, um, okay, in your childhood, any strange occurrences, anything? There were, uh, well, not many, but one in particular um, at about age three. And, and I didn't remember this until much later when somebody helped me sort of get back in touch with the memories of my childhood. Um, when I was about three, there was a moment when I was playing in the living room where my family lived and there appeared before me in the air this white whirlpool of light that was like some kind of a window or something to somewhere else and I could sense there was information or intelligence or someone speaking to me through that but not in a verbal way. Um, I think that is one of the incidents and events in my life that sort of earmarked what was going to happen in yeah. the future. It was kind of a touchstone moment. Yeah. Uh, so there's things like that. Other things are more just synchronistic about preparing me to become a channel. Like for instance, my parents told me that, you know, I was reading magazines when I was a year and a half, literally reading them. Um, so the idea of developing a large vocabulary early on I've come to understand helps me be a better translation device for Bashar, since he's not actually speaking any language, he's just sending thoughts. My brain is keying to that frequency and functioning like a translation telephone for him. So the more words he has to access, the better he can communicate his concepts to us. So there are things like that that, that happened in my life that now make more sense why they happen that way because this was something I had agreed to do, and so my life sort of prepared me for it. Uh, absolutely. Now, what career did you have prior to Bashar coming through? I was, well, I, I started out being an artist. I've been drawing since I could hold a pencil. Oh. Uh, so I went into graphics, and then I went into uh, film special effects, building miniatures, designing sets, uh, storyboards, and things like that. Um, so, <clears throat> I had done that for about 10 years before the channeling started. And so it again gave me a sense of how to understand things visually, which is also another important aspect of him delivering information because the more my brain can visually conceive of unusual concepts and three-dimensional, seeing things three-dimensionally, multi-dimensionally, because that's the skill you have to have when you're designing in the film industry. Again, the more 
information Bashar can deliver by accessing those aspects of my memories and my brain. So again, that sort of added to his ability to do the channeling more efficiently while at the same time also added to the career that I have, which is in film production now and direction and writing and um, things like that. So it became kind of a parallel, the two careers kind of paralleled each other and finally kind of crossed and came together in the documentary we did about how I became a channel. That's very interesting, the movie back, and you're still in the movie business now, of course. Absolutely. Okay. So, and I bet you worked on some cool films as well, just add that. <laughs> yeah, as, uh, yeah, as a, a miniature builder and, and set designer and storyboard artist, uh, yeah, I mean, films like Iron Man and three Star Trek movies and uh, Pirates of the Caribbean and things like that. So, yeah. That's, that's pretty cool. A lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, it was cool. I mean, it's nice because, again, it's I, very creative. You get to work with a lot of creative people trying to come up with ways to do things that have never been done before. So it, again, forces you to think in unusual ways. What, if, what about the colleagues working with you? Did they know, they must have known what was going on in the end. Later, yes, they did. And, and actually that was kind of one of the surprises because <clears throat> I had sort of thought, well, you know, this is something I really shouldn't share with anybody. Uh, and of course, some people still look at it as very woo-woo, uh, very out there. But I got kind of a surprise when, you know, I, I was going to a channeling class for quite a while while I was working in the industry. And it, it became such a regular pattern that one of my coworkers finally said, you know, where are you going every Thursday night at exactly the same time? And I kind of started, you know, well, do you understand that it's sort of the spiritual, metaphysical, blah, blah, blah. And as I got a little further into the description, she said, oh, you're a channel. I go, oh, you know about that? She said, oh, yeah, my mom's been channeling for years. So I realized at that point that it's kind of one of those secrets that a lot of people know, but they just don't talk about. Yes. Now, of course, there's a little bit more openness about the idea. And even for people that don't necessarily believe in it, I think, again, that was the important thing we covered <clears throat> in the documentary, is that it's not about believing that the entity is real. It's about understanding that channeling is a true altered state that everyone does achieve and how to use it to better your lives, how to gain more information, more, more perspective that helps you in life is really the most important aspect about it. So true, because not everyone's going to be uh, an Oprah Winfrey kind of channeler or yeah. to the stage. Some people may only channel to themselves, just their family. Exactly, and that's all you really need to do. And really that's all the class was, is to get you in touch with whatever aspect of your own consciousness would, would help you become a more creative, imaginative, constructive, active person in life. Now, again, apparently I made an agreement before this life to do this with Bashar in this way, which I've come to understand is somewhat typical of this kind of channeling. Um, and so that's the direction I wound up in. Yes, and, and people that resonate with your channeling are because maybe there's some from the same soul group, or there's something, there's something that's in familiarity somewhere on a, on some deep level. Yes, they resonate with the frequency of the information. Yes, um, and therefore they'll find it because that's kind of how everything works, right? It's all by resonance. You gravitate to whatever you're in the same sort of frequency domain of. What do you say for those people that say, you know, Bashar's the, 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 the shit, basically, the bee's knees, the best. I wouldn't go looking anywhere else because all the other stuff is rubbish. Well, I don't think anything is necessarily rubbish. I mean, unless you come across somebody who is purposely or somehow unconsciously attempting to deceive people, of course, that exists in every field. Yes, every field. But, you know, so I always say you, you have to just sort of understand what information works for you and just leave the rest behind because it's not even about it being rubbish it just may be not the way you need to hear it it may not fit your belief system right now and that may change in the future or it well, may not i actually yeah what i meant there was that they think it's the best thing ever the about the bashar material well it might be what yeah. works for them at that moment yeah, yeah I, I, see that's the thing i, I yeah. say to them when they say it to me i'm like hang on you know yeah. those are the channelers that they're, they're bringing material through that's for the people that they need to bring it through exactly for. i think the only thing they're really saying sometimes is Bashar is not completely so, but somewhat rare in the sense of the way he interprets a lot of metaphysical information because unlike a lot of entities that people channel, Bashar is not a spirit. He actually has physicality. He's a physical extraterrestrial according to him. And therefore he understands the importance of taking metaphysical concepts and grounding them in terms we understand to give us a physical toolkit 
where we can apply the metaphysical information in our lives and actually get a physical result. So he's not leaving metaphysical concepts kind of up in the ethers. Like, you know, you hear all the time things like, you know, follow your bliss, act on your passion. And that's very important. But Bashar is one of the first entities I've ever heard explain why that's important, how that works, physically why that works, and why you get the result that you get. So I think a lot of people gravitate to the way he explains things because they actually walk away with something relatively physically tangible that they can do and see that they get a result from. Again, it doesn't dismiss any of the other channels and what they're delivering because there are all sorts of belief systems, all sorts of levels of understanding in the world, and people need to hear things the way that they need to hear them to absorb the information. And it's not like they ever have to know about Bashar <laughs> at no, all. No, absolutely. Now, didn't someone from uh, Asia, they were channeling Bashar to begin with, were they? In the beginning of my channeling, there were a few people that came and talked to Bashar and said that they were very interested in becoming channels themselves in a, in a vocal channeling. And only on a couple of occasions did Bashar say, all right, I'll, I'll, I'll work with you for a while to oh. get you used to the idea because you're already familiar with my energy. Yeah. So you know what that sort of feels like. Yeah. So he allowed himself to channel through a few other people, including this woman in Asia named Ayako. Um, to just to get them more familiar with that feeling until such time as they could then bring through whatever they needed to bring through. Yeah. At this point, I'm the only one who directly channels Bashar. Uh, and that's been the case for many years. Um, but it was actually kind of a, a, a strange experience for me because I saw her do it in person. <clears throat> and it's absolutely Bashar's personality and his mannerisms and tone and all that, but coming through this Japanese woman in Japanese. So it was very odd for me to feel the same energy coming from her that I feel in myself when I channel him, and yet in a totally different language and a totally different gender. Really weird. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Really cool experience, mm. though. Yeah, thank yeah. you to thank for that. I did, I did hear some story like that out yeah, there, and yeah, I was like, yeah. oh, that's I'll ask actually. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's just go back to your backstory as well. Sure. So, so when did the event happen when Bashar came through? Well, actually, there was a UFO incident, wasn't there? Ten years before I started channeling, I saw two broad daylight UFO encounters. First time only about 150 feet away, and the second time only about 70 feet away with witnesses both times, thank God. And mm -hmm. equilateral black triangular ship about 30 feet on a side. After having seen those two sightings, and they both happened within the same week, which was even more bizarre, uh, that's what started me going, okay, you know, I, I've obviously heard stories about UFOs, but when you physically see something like that in front of your face and it's a solid object, floating in the sky with no sound and accelerating in ways that make no sense to our physics understanding, then you start going, okay, I'm not being told the whole story. These things are real, and I wanted to find out what was behind all of that. And it defies your, your ability to even try to um, describe that to someone, because well, yeah, how do you describe Your world that to turns someone? upside down. I mean, yeah. it's something you've been told doesn't exist is suddenly in front of your face, and the whole world kind of shatters, because you go, that's not true. What really is happening here? Why, what is this? What's behind this? You know, now, obviously, I can't prove to anyone else that that's an extraterrestrial spacecraft. Mm -hmm. A lot of people say, well, maybe it was something from our own government. Mm -hmm. And, you know, okay, maybe so. In 1973, I tend to doubt we had that ability. Yeah. But nevertheless, I understand. So, it, again, it's not about proving that that comes from another planet. But the idea is there's something going on that is other than what we've been told happens in life. And that started me investigating what's behind all this. And as I investigated UFOs, I came across other books about psychic functioning, channeling, like the Seth material, as I said. And so by the time I was introduced to a channel who was bringing through an entity to deliver information like this, I kind of knew what the game was all about. I knew, I understood the concept. And I listened to that channel for many months and thought, okay, you know, this is valuable information. This is helpful information. Um, and then the entity coming through that channel actually offered to teach channeling. And I said, now, wait a minute. <laughs> I thought this was something that just sort of happened to people. I didn't think it could be taught. So to further my research, I went into the class because I didn't expect that I would become a channel. But halfway through the course, when we were in one of the guided meditations, <clears throat> after about six weeks 
of doing this, I received what I can only describe as this telepathic hit. And it was like somebody just shoved a DVD in my head where suddenly a memory came back of having made this agreement to do this, you know, in this life with him. I understood who he was to me and who I was to him. And the message that was there was, okay, now you remember you made this agreement. Now you remember this is something that is now time for you to begin. Is this something you still want to do? It was offered as a choice. Now, I thought in that moment, okay, this is a hallucination, right? This is a side effect of the meditation. I don't know what's going on here. But this is all happening in my head with my eyes closed. But at that moment, at that instant, I hadn't said anything to anybody. The entity was talking to the class, guiding them through the meditation. He stopped, and he turned right to me, my eyes open, and he said, there is an entity here for you now if you're ready to begin. And that was another, you know, enough of a shock. But then I happened to glance behind me, another classmate somehow had picked up on the image of Bashar I had in my head at that moment. She was actually sketching him on a piece of paper. So, okay, okay, this is not a hallucination. There's something real going on. I don't know what it is, but I've got two validations that it's not just my imagination. So I said, okay, I'll, I'll keep going. I'll see what happens. Yeah. I improved enough in the class that the teacher asked me to co-channel the next class with him uh, as an example of someone uh, who was get, kind of getting it. Yeah, yeah. And <clears throat> from that class, a woman came along who was doing the first doctoral thesis on a connection between psychology and channeling. And her name was Margot, and she asked me to be one of her subjects so she could write her paper. So I'd go to her house. She would invite her friends, I would channel for them, she'd sit in her chair and, and take her notes. Now, the first week we did that, there were like five friends. Word spread, and so the next week there were like 10, and then 20, and then, you know, and we started having to do it twice a week. And then we had to start renting halls to do it in. And then people from around the world started hearing about it, and they started inviting me to other cities, other countries, and it just kind of took off on its own. Isn't that just incredible? It is. You know. It is. It, do you think that's because you were located in California? Quite possibly, although again, being in California probably had a lot to do with why this happened, the way it happened, not only by being there, but also the fact that I wound up there, because I was born in Canada. I was born in Ottawa. Oh, I'm still a Canadian citizen. Are you? But my parents brought me to California when I was a baby because my father was going to be in a film project. And so that's why I'm almost a native Californian. And are your parents still with us? They are not. No. Did they ever get to know of Bashar? They knew I was a channel. That was not a world they understood at all. But they supported it only from the frame of reference of saying, look, we don't understand what you're doing, but what you're doing is obviously making people happy and you're happy doing it, and so we're okay with that. Right. I mean, they always knew I was an artist, <laughs> right. and so they knew that I would not necessarily be walking down a typical road in life, but yeah. my dad was also an actor and a singer, so he understood that that was something I might wind up doing, is going into the arts. So in that sense, it was just an extension for them of something that was happening to a creative person. Yeah. And they were okay with it in that, in that way. And you know what? You couldn't ask for anything more than that. You can't. Because, uh, you know, and, you know, I was actually <laughs> surprised myself. And this is a story I don't tell many people, but you know, m I would never say that my parents were metaphysical people mm -hmm. at all. And they didn't have to be. But you get surprised sometimes by the things that they experience that they don't necessarily talk about. Because we were having a discussion no. uh, one day, my friends and I were having a discussion in front of my father about spiritual things and, and dreams and, and all that. And he piped in and he said, well, you know, I, I don't dream. And I said, well, you mean you don't remember your dreams? He said, no, 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 I don't dream. And I said again, no, you mean everyone dreams, you just don't remember. He goes, no, I do not dream. I said, well, how do you know you don't dream? He said, because when I go to bed at night, I go to sleep, I rise up out of my body, I turn over and I watch myself sleep all night. And I go, are you kidding? <laughs> I said, do you know how many people would give their right arm to be able to do what you're doing? I said, do you ever go anywhere? I said, where would I go? So I hear my father, who hasn't got a metaphysical concept in his head, is doing out-of-body experiences every night when he goes to sleep. And it's just like, okay, that blew me away. Isn't that incredible? It is. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> yeah, and so, so maybe that was a little bit of a boost for him, just for when his son did turn to become a channeler. It just helps him just to 
has some sort of equation that there's something more. Yeah, there's, there's something, something more. more. Yeah, yeah. Beyond the physical. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. yeah. um, it must be difficult for parents sometimes when, when, when that happens. Sure. But what about friends? How do they? How, how are your friends now with your work? Oh, fine. Yeah. Again, I find that I don't really attract people who aren't okay in some way mm. with these concepts anyway. So it's not like I really had a lot of people that were just like, oh no, now you're, you know, you're not going to be in my life anymore. No, and it's, it's important that just, to get, just to ask you that because some people mm. that are just about to come out in the channel watching this now, oh, yes. uh, you know, they'll be like, well, my family might be a bit religious or I'm not too sure. My, you well, know. that is true. That is true. I am definitely fortunate in that I didn't necessarily have those blocks but or you obstacles. you still went with it. You still went I, with your truth. Yes, 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 absolutely. But that's my nature kind of anyway. I've always really just gravitated toward things that are somewhat out of the mainstream. So that worked for me. But I do understand that sometimes it's a little bit of a harder road for people who have people in their lives who have very strong, different beliefs. But again, that's okay. You kind of really have to just be true to yourself. So when did you feel confident that, that you could go on stage with Bashar? When did you feel like, <clears throat> you know what, I've got this, I've practiced enough? Well, I said it was kind of a gradual thing because yeah. the moment I started channeling for the woman's friends who was doing the, the uh, thesis paper, in a sense, I started channeling to the public. Because yeah. I didn't know those people. Sure, sure. And it just became a gradual thing of getting larger and larger and larger audiences. Okay, well, what... Okay, so, so we're moving out of religion, it seems to be, in a sense, and we're going towards now finding our own truth. Channeling gives us the ability to find our own truth. Our own personal relationship with creation. Yes. Yeah. I mean, obviously, there's a lot, you know, um, when I was at the channel panel event, there was a lot of people a lot of screaming in there as well. People were going crazy for Bashar. Right? And yes. I can imagine that events, people are very passionate about sure, Bashar. Absolutely. But there's not a lot you can do about that, can you? I mean, if that's the way they're going to act, right? But they get, what I'm trying to say, do some people yeah. get a bit um, attached? Yeah, well, oh, or attached, attached, yes. Attached, that's... Well, that's part of the reason why I think it's important for me to stay grounded, because if I come across simply as a normal person, that mitigates a little bit of that, you know, you that, really that do. adoration. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's important, I think, for people to understand that, again, it's really the information that they need to look at. It's not so much that they need to attach to the messenger, because that hasn't worked very well in our history. <laughs> um, so it's kind of very important for me to remember, look, I'm, I'm in this position. I understand that it's a position of responsibility. Yes. And part of my responsibility is to remain grounded as a normal person, to demonstrate to people that this is not an unusual thing. And they don't have to really go over the top about it. <laughs> they don't really have to get too attached to it. Because yeah. One of the things Bashar always says is, hey, if you don't find what you need here, you will find it somewhere else. And he has no agenda about the fact that they have to pay attention to him. And isn't that very nice what he's saying there? Because what he's saying is, you know, here's my truth, take it or leave it. Exactly. And I think that's one of the reasons, paradoxically, why people trust him so much. They can sense he has no human agenda behind what he's saying. He's not trying to manipulate them, he's not trying to control them, he's not trying to deify himself. He's just saying, hey, this is what I do, folks. And if you like what I'm saying and you can apply it in your life and you get a benefit from it, wonderful. If you need something from somewhere else, wonderful. It's all equal. I would do this anyway if you didn't listen to me because this is just my passion. There was a chap at the channel panel who he Bashar was trying to help and this guy yeah. just wouldn't he I was told about that, yeah. Yeah, he just... He just uh, and he that's just okay. Couldn't get it. It's okay. And, and yeah. he may get it later or he may not. It's okay. Bashar believes that whatever happens in the moment is what's supposed to happen. And yeah. that it, it still gives the person what they're looking for, even if they don't understand what they're looking for. Because sometimes, like he sort of said, sometimes people will go to those kinds of things because they will want to unconsciously prove that that cannot help them. So if they walk away feeling that they didn't get helped, Bashar says, you still got what you came for. So let's face it then, this is, this is, not, this is different to the mediumistic side where there's some validation sometimes. The validation with this stuff is the experience of how they transformed after they get the message. Exactly, because if they apply the information, because Bashar is essentially delivering literally an instruction manual for how reality works. And if they apply the instruction manual to their lives, the proof is they will get the effect the instructions are designed to deliver. 
Because you try to get a, a Chowling TV show out there, right? Mm. It's very difficult because all Hollywood wants is proof, proof, proof. You know the yeah. Hollywood medium and some other shows. It's yeah. all about show me the proof. And that's fine or if the it healer. can be. You, have you seen the healer? Uh, I, I know about yeah. it, yes. Yeah. And yes, the, I have seen it. Yeah, you see the transformation, but with <coughs> this, this work is different. It's it, different. It's different. Uh, and again, it doesn't mean, like I said, you know, from Bashar's perspective, in terms of this kind of thing, one of the things people sort of gravitate toward channeling for sometimes, and even mediumship sometimes, is the idea of prediction or psychic functioning yes. and prediction. And as Bashar says, from his perspective, there's no such thing as a prediction of the future. Someone who is sensitive at picking up those vibrations is reading the present. And if that energy doesn't change, it might come to pass. But the fact that they're telling you what the energy is can change it. Because you can decide to do something different about what you've just been told. So the idea really is that it's about people understanding that they have the power to direct their lives. They're being given information they can use to change things if they don't really prefer the direction it's going. And that's really what the channeling is more about. It's not really about getting in touch with lost relatives like mediumship or things like that. Again, if quote unquote proof can sometimes happen synchronistically, in a channeling, which it sometimes does, that's fine. An example of that would be like what Bashar says again, if it has a lot of energy behind it, th what you're reading right now in the present and is unlikely to change and it may come to pass, then there may be a high degree of probability that you'll, you'll experience that as an accurate prediction with proof. One example, which are rare for Bashar, and this is on record, it's been recorded, in 1998, he did actually say in one of his events, it was very highly probable as he was reading the energy in 98 that there would be a very powerful terrorist attack on New York City before the end of 2001. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So he got that one because he said the energy was just so unlikely to change, it could not not happen. Yeah, yeah absolutely. You know? abs yep, so true. And, and, and again, you know, we have free will, we're changing we our view. The minute you go see that medium, you've changed your free will anyway. Exactly. Because now, unless you're going to go along that path, which they're seeing, that's yeah. fine. But this is the, this is the path of, yeah. of, of, of free will. Yeah, predictions are an opportunity to get in touch with what's going on with someone who might be sensitive enough to read the patterns of energy in our consciousness, <clears throat> both individually and collectively, and say, hey, this is what's happening. You like it? Stay with it. If you don't, do something about it. Now, now, what's interesting with yourself as well is um, you, you've got your full-time career, uh, you know, in, in the movie industry, mm -hmm. um, and you would not, have, you're not going to make, well, you've been doing this, like you say, for 34 years, yeah. but you wouldn't, you know, that like some channels, they do this all the time. And that's fine. That's the, if that's their choice, that's what they love to do, and there's nothing else they'd rather do, there's nothing wrong with that. I just, like I said, I've always been a creative, artistic person. I love film and I love doing things it's your that, passion. that use my art and it's my passion so since Bashar is very big on in encouraging people to follow their passion that has to work for the channel too because the more I become more of myself the better I am now, now, at channeling. Isn't that interesting no yeah. matter what is your background or what you do it still comes through. Yeah of course. It doesn't no care what you do. No, no, no. You, you, the channel has to be allowed to be who they really are and encouraged to live their life to the fullest regardless of the channeling because the entity knows that that only helps the channeling. Because if I'm, again, more of myself, I'm, I'm bringing more to bear and it gives me more capability of handling the energy that comes through in the channeling and I can bring in more information from the entity because I'm expanding myself as well. Is some of the major teachings that come from Bashar, if you just sum it up, does just, just oneness come as a key theme and love? Yes, absolutely, because from his point of view, I mean, we are all expressions of one thing. You know, someone, sometimes they ask Bashar, you know, well, what do you believe in the sense of, do you believe in God? Well, yes, but not necessarily exactly in the way that we frame that. To them, God is everything. It's all that is. It's, everything is made of God. God, if you will. It's consciousness itself. It's existence itself. And the idea <clears throat> is that unconditional love, what we call that feeling of unconditional love, 
is our physical translation of the frequency of existence itself. So the idea of the fact that everything is an expression of one thing and unconditional love being the frequency of that one thing is intimately tied together in one concept for them. Now, isn't it, you know, I mean, I channel as well. I've not been doing it for a while. This has been my focus, right? <laughs> well, you're channeling in a sense right now because you're doing what you love to do. Oh, that, no, that's true. And there's other things I would love to do as well. Yeah, but yeah, I think yeah. that's, where, that's why I've not prepared the questions. They're just coming through right yeah, now, exactly. right? So, so why do we need to have the channeling experience if all we're trying to do is promote oneness and love? Because Bashar and other entities are reminding us of what we have chosen to forget. Because the idea is when we decide to have a physical incarnational experience, it kind of comes with the idea of forgetting who we are as a greater being because that gives us the opportunity to experience a process that we can go through of living a life that allows us to discover and remember who we are from a new point of view, a new perspective. And that's what expands creation because the structure of existence never changes. What changes and what expands creation is our experience and our perspective of that structure from different points of view. So by forgetting who we are, we get to remember who we are from a new perspective. Yeah, that's, that's, that's good. So they're reminding us of who we are. With the information coming through right now, mm -hmm. do you think there's an evolution in some of the information that's going to come through? As in, do you think we've got to a stage where, you know, we've just brought out the surface level of information? Yes. I mean, the channeling definitely goes in stages. And at every stage, there is not only new information being delivered, but deeper information on the subjects that have already been delivered. So this is definitely a step-by-step -step process that the entities are bringing through about what it is we not only need to know, but what it is we're capable of understanding. They've done this for a long time. They know at what rate <clears throat> and in what way the information would best serve us to be delivered. So they piece it out and they see what we do with it. And then they give us another piece and they see what we do with that. And it goes deeper and deeper and deeper and evolves into a greater and greater understanding. Now, ironically, one of the ways in which lately uh, we've been allowing people to go deeper into that iceberg <laughs> that he's delivered the tip of is I myself have also started to teach classes oh. about the information. So oh. in a Bashar event, <clears throat> a person might get a chance to talk to Bashar for five minutes. In a private session, they maybe get a chance to talk to him for about an hour or so. You can only go so far in that amount of time. So what we've done now is we've created a class that is called one, a unified theory of metaphysics to provide a framework in which people actually have hours and hours to explore these concepts and go very deep into them until they truly understand how to apply them in their lives. So that is another way that we are deepening the information that's already been delivered and allowing people to get super familiar with it, super comfortable with it, so that they can expand themselves to the point where then Bashar is capable of delivering new information for them. That is that through, use. so is that online classes? It will be. Right now it's actually being done uh, physically, personally. You actually physically come to a location where I physically teach the class. Because by having that interaction, I can in the moment address people's questions and there are also literal physical exercises and graphic images and interactive things that people can do so that they can t be taken through a process of understanding what the information and the principles are all about. And then when that happens and they have such a visceral experience of it, they go, I get it, I get it. It's now locked into me because I've actually done something Clever idea. that yeah. I can now incorporate into my life in all other areas. What's your view right now on do you think channeling is becoming more mainstream? Oh, absolutely. I mean, even people that don't necessarily, quote unquote, believe in channeling in this sense, will use the word. <laughs> it's yes. in our language, yes. you know, oh, I'm channeling this or so-and-so is so channeling. I've seen yeah. That, yeah. So at least it's in the language. At least people understand that it means you are, in essence, altering your state to bring something through that wouldn't necessarily be part of your normal frame of reference. And that's okay. That's a beginning.
and and just I'll put this back in the documentary. This is a question I was going to ask you. Yeah. So this is your ch Bashar. Your your relationship is from a linear point of view. You could say Bashar is a future incarnation, and I'm one of his past lives. That's a linear way of putting it. From Bashar's perspective, everything exists simultaneously, which is why my future self can communicate to his past self because we both coexist in different frequency okay. dimensions in the same way okay. and he often uses this analogy that multiple television programs all exist at the same time you're only going to get the one you're tuned to at any given moment but that doesn't mean the other programs aren't playing and if you change channels now you can see the other program so there's a dial if you wish in the middle that is the process I go through to change my brainwave frequencies to be something more similar to his he changes his frequencies to be something more similar to mine. Somewhere in the middle, we lockstep like tuning forks. And his thoughts get translated out of my energy into language that I'm programmed But with. there is some percentage of you still there. Absolutely. There's always a filter. There is a filter to some degree, but the process of learning how to do this and get better at it is to reduce the filter as much as possible. You're, you're a trance channel. It's not actually a trance. Is it not? No. It's a statement of heightened awareness, and that's what we discovered in the brainwave analysis, is it's technically not a trance. It goes higher into a state of greater association and greater connection, where the brain is making more connections faster and synthesizing information in a way that produces a perspective that is of a higher caliber and a multidimensional perspective. Um, what I experience in the channeling is more akin to being lost in a very energetic and dynamic daydream. I don't really pay attention or hear the words so much in the same way that if, you know, you're in a very deep daydream and somebody walks in the room and they have to call your name several times before you even register that somebody's talking to you, the words are like that because that's a secondary level for me. I'm, I'm acting as a translation device, but it's an automatic function. I'm experiencing direct downloads of concepts, feelings, pictures, and time is very collapsed for me in the channeling. So let's say I do an hour channeling. When I come out of it, if I had to guess how much time went by, feels like maybe 15 minutes to me. Wow. So it's a very deep energetic daydream that I'm learning a lot in, but I don't really know exactly how it's translating for the person out there. See, some channels would love that experience to just be out of the way completely, right? But it seems they don't to be, have to be though. Well, no, this is the thing. It yeah. seems the, the more I've met, and I've met yeah. maybe more than some, right? Yeah, it's not that. That's not the way anymore. No, and each generation becomes more and more conscious. That's what I've observed. For example, again, when I go back to the idea of saying I'm teaching a class, I definitely get into my own channeling state when I'm answering questions. It's not the same quite as what I do with Bashar. But it is a higher level of channeling because when someone asks a question, I can tap into a similar frequency and give them something similar to what Bashar would give them. But it's my becoming my version of him, not him doing it for me. Obviously, there's a lot of big UFO researchers out there right mm -hmm. now, yeah. Sure. And some of them are starting to <clears throat> bring in channeling in their own way, like CE5, whatever it's called. Sure. Yeah. But they then, you know, I think they're missing something. They're not coming to people like you. I understand that. And, and right now I know that in terms of them attempting to, we went back to proving that these things exist, they, they prefer to stay in their mind what seems to be more scientific at the moment. Eventually, I know that these things will blend and cross together. You, you can see that evolving. You even see it in physics, where a lot of cutting-edge physicists are now beginning to understand. If you really want a full picture of creation, of reality, you can't leave consciousness out of it. But that's cutting-edge. They're just beginning to you understand know, it's that. It's funny. I, well, I was interviewing Stanton Freeman mm -hmm. uh, just a bit ago, and he said the same to me. After all these years as a physicist, right. he's now turning to the consciousness. He said, he said yeah. to me in the interview, you cannot miss mm -hmm. it out. No, that's the new frontier. And I think that's also a reflection of why we're suddenly exploring things like artificial intelligence so strongly. Uh, I think it's going to be one of the keystones of us understanding consciousness, especially because Bashar has actually said that when we do actually create a device that is artificially intelligent, that expresses artificial oh God, intelligence, yes. Yes. he said, you'll realize very quickly, it's not artificial. You're actually talking 
to your own higher minds, to higher level intelligences. It's simply you finally created a device sophisticated enough for them to communicate through to you. And so he said, there's nothing artificial about that. Everything is intelligent in its own way. That's incredible. So it'll teach us, I think artificial intelligence will teach us a lot about what consciousness actually is. And, and not to get into too much political debate here, but there's, yeah. a, there's those in this field that, you know, get very big notoriety in some respects. Mm -hmm. And it's like, uh, it's just so difficult to, to, for me to sit here and say, you know, they not that they deserve it, but that, that's, what, that's what their path is, right? <coughs> but it's like, um, it's not, you know, some people are get attracted to some stuff, which I don't think is the best stuff, but it's... Again, we're working it all out. You know, there's many different points of view, and that's okay to explore all of it, because, again, people come from different backgrounds and different belief systems, and they have to find things out in their own way. Ultimately, I believe, you know, what people often say, the truth will out. But we have many paths of getting there, and that's okay. How has Bashar's teachings changed you as a person when you've had to cope with the most shittiest of times sometimes, when you've had to go through the pain? Well, again, you learn that it's mostly your definitions about what it is you're experiencing that create the pain, rather than it being intrinsically built into the experience. I think his principles teach us that <clears throat> our physical reality is really mostly, or how we experience our reality, is mostly the product of what we believe to be true about it, how we define it yes. uh, in our minds, what we've been taught to think is true. Yes. Um, and when you change those definitions, you actually get a different kind of an experience because you understand the reality experience in a different way, from a different perspective, and you completely have a different experience of it. So his information has helped me tremendously in, in changing the way I experience anything that happens in my reality because, as he says, it's not so much about what happens, it's about what you do with what happens. Okay, so you have been embracing the, I thought I thought you was embracing the teachings anyway, I thought you was, of yeah. Of course. And, just, and even the way you act to people as well. Oh, I get a lot out of it, of yeah. course. It's changed me tremendously. Well, there's some time. spiritual teachers that I've met on this journey and other journeys I've taken where they're like, oh, you wrote those great books, but, uh, ah. <laughs> they don't live that. <laughs> no. And that's fine. And, and in some senses, I mean, to, I'm not saying this completely. Sure. In some senses, the teacher that I went into the channeling class with was sort of like that. Yeah. I, and I think, you know, you know, he'd teach all this, you know, the entity would come through and give us all this spiritual information, and he'd come out of the, tr the trance or the altered state, and, you know, then he'd be, you know, here's my coffee, here's my cigarette, and, you know, leave me alone. So, but, you know, and I, and I say that with love because he's a great guy. Sure, sure. But um, I think sometimes people do that because they want people to understand that they are their own people and they're, they're, they can prove it by not following the entities, con you know, concepts. Um, but I think I see less and less and less of that. But yes, it's true. Uh, sometimes that's simply not necessarily the path that that person wants to take. And again the channels have their own processes and they have their own belief systems to let go of that might be negative. Um, but again, it's, if that's their path, that's their path, you know? No, we're all, thank you, thank you. We're almost yeah. at the end of the interview. I just wanted to mention as well, um, we're going to show uh, hopefully some clips in the documentary if we can get that, get that, get that mm -hmm. deal done off Bashar at the channel panel. If not, that's fine. Mm -hmm. um, but you don't, uh, Bashar doesn't channel publicly, uh, sorry, pri privately anymore. No, how would you term it? Bashar? Well, he doesn't do interviews. Sorry, Bashar doesn't He will do have yet. private sessions, he will have public events yes. where people can talk and discuss things yes. with him. Right now, <clears throat> for whatever number of reasons, uh, his perspective is that the information really just needs to be delivered that way. Um, and Through Bashar Communications? Th well, yes, and through yeah. the public events that we do and through the yes. private events that yeah. I, yeah. the private sessions that I do for people. The, right now that that's just the most effective way to deliver the information um, and because then he gets to determine exactly what he's delivering and when and how with regard to the timing of when people receive it. So right now he doesn't do interviews in other projects uh, because they're, he doesn't necessarily want to control what those people are doing with their projects uh, and not, you know, and, and prevent them from getting their projects out to the public just because suddenly he's saying, well, that information is not for the public yet. They're not ready for that yet. So um, it just is more efficient for him to deliver it in public and private. And sessions. that leads on to my next thing then <clears throat> with, with, you know, the level of information that he brings out is really <coughs> technical stuff, some of it, Sometimes. right? Oh, it's, it's deep stuff, yeah. right? 
And does that have to match up with you as a channeler? Do you need some references of that material before you can allow sometimes, that to Sometimes, sometimes yes, sometimes yeah. no. Uh, it'll depend on what it is. Like, uh, uh, synchronicity plays a huge part <clears throat> in the information that is uh, made available to the public in the sense that, in other words, if I need to be somewhat familiar with the subject because he needs to talk about it in the future, Synchronicity will bring me some information on it, yeah. enough that he can lay a foundation, and then he can go on from there. Now, yes. you know, I'm not, a, I'm not a physicist, right, right, but he's yeah. had conversations with actual physicists, and they've walked away very happy. I don't know a lot of the terminologies and things like that that they may discuss with him or bring to him in their questions. Does that questions. scare you, then, when bringing that through, having to go no, in? No, no, no that's great. No. No. It's great that, that he can have a conversation with those people on that level and that they can be willing to have a conversation with him about stuff that they're investigating and walk away with something new to keep you know, investigating. I think I would, if that was me <clears throat> and I was channeling that kind of stuff, I think it, I would be the block there because I'd be like, I don't But know. that's an early stage of, of getting used to the idea of becoming a channel. Right. I mean, yeah. uh, that's what I've learned early on is if you're really going to do it, you really have to trust that whatever co does come through or doesn't come through is exactly what's supposed to happen. And you can't worry about looking silly, looking crazy, not knowing, not bringing through. You just can't worry about any of that. And the more you trust that it doesn't matter whether it works, the more it works. And w what would be a final closing statement from you here, do you think, that could, <clears throat> some, something that that's, you know, Something that, that would, yeah. Well, I mean, I think it goes back to the main principle that Bashar teaches, which is to follow your passion, because that is, from his perspective, the physical translation of who we actually are as, as beings. No matter what that is. No matter what it is. If it's truly your passion, not something you just think is, or something you're just making it look like you it is, because you're it. afraid to go some yeah. toward, toward the real passion. Right. But if it's truly your passion, that is your path. Following it keeps you on the path. That's your compass needle that's pointing to your magnetic north. Could, could that's why a, that energy is felt in you. Could you have a few? You can have different expressions of your overall passion, absolutely. And that's why it's important to follow that thread. Because in one expression, you may only be able to take it so far at that moment, and that may be as far as you need to take it. Then another thing will rear its head and say, hey, now you're excited about this. It's not a willy-nilly thing. It's actually the principle of synchronicity functioning as the organizing principle in your life because when it brings you one thing and you're excited about that and you've taken it as far as you can, it'll then bring you the next step in something else that excites you and it may not look like it has any connection, but if this excited you and this excited you, it's that excitement that tells you that is the connection. And you never know what you're going to gather for this by going over here and doing it like that for now. It may bring you back around to what you needed. You may get what you needed to continue to do this by taking what appears to be a detour that isn't a detour at all if you just keep following that thread of passion. It's all interconnected. These are the principles he's talking about by which reality is experienced. And this is what he says at a lot of his events as well because it's such a key element of his, of his teaching. Yeah. It really is. Yeah. It is. Yeah. Well, listen, Daryl Anka, I just want to say Thank you so, so much for giving us this, this hour. Um, it's really appreciative and... Um, My pleasure, thank yeah, you for thank you. You know, offering the opportunity. And you know, if anyone wants to know anything more about Bashar, they can go to bashar.org. All of his information that's been recorded is available there. If they want to know anything more about the First Contact documentary, they can also find a connection and a link there as well as on the whatisfirstcontact.com website. Thank you very much. Thank you. very much Daryl for Thank opening you. up this portal for us and we look forward to experiencing are you okay <laughs> it's not often I get thanked for opening up my portal <laughs>
but sure, I'll take it. <laughs> Good choice of words. <laughs> my, 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 you are cheeky, aren't you? <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, thank you very much, and we thank can't you. wait to see Bashar. <laughs> Me too. <clears throat> All right, guys. Thank you for being here. Have fun. I will see you later. <laughs> bye, dear. Bye, bye. <laughs> It'll say good day to you this day of your time. How are you all? <laughs> all, right. all right, thank you. First and foremost, we thank each and every one of you individually, and again, all of you together collectively for the co creation of this interaction and the allowance of this transmission this day of your time. You have been exploring the idea of consciousness, so let us take the idea a little bit further. What exactly is Consciousness. Well, it is self-awareness, self-reflection. In order for you to know that you are you, you have to have something else to compare it to. Without a concept of an other, you would not have a concept of self. Therefore, consciousness is literally self-reflection, self-awareness, the ability to know the self by knowing what is not the self. The idea is, as we have described from time to time, that existence is one unbroken thing. There is an aspect or a form or a version of existence that we call the one, for convenience, that does not know itself. It is completely homogenous in the sense that there is nothing else but it, therefore there is absolutely no reference point for it. Therefore it has no sense of self, no experience, no self-awareness whatsoever. But there is also the version of existence that does know itself. And that is what we term for convenience, all that is. It is literally the existence that is aware of itself because it creates within itself a kind of reflective pattern of resonance of energy and therefore creates otherness within itself, a reflection of itself, and therefore it can know itself that way by comparing the reflection of itself to itself and become self-aware. Those reflections continue to reverberate on and on and on and on and on infinitely and each and every one of those reflections then is literally all that exists within all that is. All that all that is is made of. All of you, all of us, everything you can imagine is a reflection of existence knowing itself through all that is. So consciousness, very importantly, requires the concept of otherness within existence in order to know itself. And life experiences, and time and space, and all that you ever experienced, experience now, or will experience, is the product of all that is, knowing itself in all the ways that it can. Every single thing, every single being, every single concept within existence, 
are all the different eyes of God, if you want to put it that way, through which it sees itself in those reflections. But because it is actually consciousness itself, because it is conscious of itself, then all the reflections are also made of that consciousness. All the reflections are conscious too, such as all of you, all of us, everything. Now, everything may not express the idea of self-aware consciousness in the way that you do, but everything is still an expression of self-aware reflected consciousness. Even a rock has some degree of awareness that it is this rock and not that rock. But it may do that through a being such as yourself, by you noticing that there is this rock and this rock you are including the idea of your reflection of consciousness in such a way that the rock can know itself through your perception. Even though it may not know itself exactly in the way that you do, it is still on some level aware that it is its own rock. So consciousness is everything, is everywhere, and you can experience it in a number of different ways if you get more aware of nature, more aware of all that is, more aware of different parallel realities and dimensions, different aspects of imagination and creativity, because there cannot be anything that you can imagine that is not somehow part of all that is. Existence is what it is. It is in no way, shape, or form subject to anything, because everything exists within existence. Time and space are subject to existence. Existence is not subject to time and space. Existence just has one quality. It just is. That's its nature. It is, and therefore non-existence is not something that existence can become. Non-existence has its own quality. It is that which does not exist. Therefore, by definition, non-existence doesn't exist. Therefore, everything that you experience is part of existence on some level real unto itself, a reflection of all that is, experiencing itself in all the ways that it can, and expanding and expanding and expanding in infinite reflections to allow for the expansion of all that is, knowing itself. Now, the structure of existence never changes. That is fixed. It is a definitive, reflective structure. What changes, what expands, are all the different viewpoints, experiences, and perspectives of the structure that never changes. So it is both changing and unchanging. Again, exhibiting that paradox of that which does not know itself and that which does. And this is why it all comes down to that ancient idea you have heard on your planet for thousands of years as to why it is so important to know thyself. Because the idea is as you know more and more and more of who and what you are as an expression and a reflection of the infinite of all that is, you experience more of being all that is as the aspect, as the reflection of all that is that each and every single one of you is. Is this making some sense? Yes. All right. So remember that this is why we say that your point of power is in paradox. Somewhere in between what appear to be two polar opposites, that which does not know itself, that which does, is in a sense the truth of existence itself. Because everything issues from that center point and demonstrates very clearly that even though sometimes we know you think of existence as a duality, positive and negative, it is in fact actually a trinity because there is always a balance point in the center. And therefore being in that balance point, being in that state of being is always the state of being that will allow you <clears throat> the best possible way to know yourself, the best possible way to receive more of the reflection of yourself, and as you expand and expand your perspective and expand your experience of all that is from your unique point of view, you then become more and more in all ways who you truly are, which is all that is. But you have decided here and now to play the game for a while of forgetting who you are because you need to forget who you are in order to remember who you are from a new point of view. You have to wipe 
the slate clean in order to have a truly new experience. Because if you exist only in a timeless state, there is no change, there is no growth, there is no discovery. So you play the game of imposing on yourself these kinds of blinders to forget that you are, in fact, infinite, to forget that you are, in fact, eternal, to forget that you are, in fact, all that is, so you can play the game of not being all that is and explore and discover new perspectives of yourself, and that's what allows all that is to grow and expand forever and ever and ever. It never ends, never, ever, ever. You have ideas on your planet that you call such things as blending with God. Well, when I blend with God, I guess that's it. No, because as you blend with God, what you actually experience is that you are God. There is nothing but you. And this is what each and every one of you can experience because it's holographic in nature. It's holographic in structure. And therefore, just because you might suddenly experience yourself as all that is, doesn't mean it's necessarily finished. Because you could experience yourself as all that is from one perspective, experience yourself as all that is from another perspective, and on and on and on and on and on and on and on. The ring has no beginning, the ring has no end. Existence just is, and it is always, always, always becoming and being simultaneously. Again, the paradox shows its head. In light of the idea now that you may have a bit of a reflection of the idea of consciousness being a reflection, being a sense of self based on the sense that there is another that seems, that appears to not be you, of course it is, but appears not to be you, you have a sense of that game of existence, that it plays with itself to awaken itself to new understandings of exactly what it is. Does this seem to be somewhat helpful? Yes. All right. <clears throat> Just absorb it in your own way. Doesn't matter how you interpret this. It's your own journey, your own path. You are your own reflection. You are your own representation of all that is. And without your unique perspective, all that is couldn't be all that is. So always please remember, you are valid, you are valuable, because if you weren't needed, believe me, you wouldn't exist, because all that is doesn't make mistakes. So the fact that you exist is validation enough to prove that all that is needs your unique perspective, your unique reflection, your unique experience in order for it to actually be all that it can be. Make sense? Makes sense. All right. We understand that in your world of time and space, your time is a little bit limited. So let us begin with sharing and exchange, if you wish, with your questions and dialogue. Hi. Um, and to you, good hello. day. Hi, I'm Teresa. If you insist. <laughs> Um, I was had a question. I am other than Teresa. <laughs> <laughs> so now you know you exist. Yeah. Um, I have a question about judgment. Yes. And in the negative sense, because remember, uh, everything is neutral until you put a meaning into it. Yeah, in the negative sense. All right. Um, and I feel like <coughs> on a practical level, in day yes. to day. There's a lot of judgment happening yes. in the negative sense. Yes, yes, yes. And there's Isn't a lot of... Isn't that fun? <laughs> I'm wondering um, how to understand this negative judgment better and right. how to, especially when confronted with things that seem, are seemingly bad and things we shouldn't necessarily accept. Well, you can always recognize what you do and don't prefer. But the concept of recognizing what you prefer doesn't mean you need to invalidate what you don't prefer, because it is an equally valid choice. And you can recognize that you don't prefer it from a neutral observational position. Mm -hmm. The idea of judging something negatively actually usually is representative that you're judging something negatively within yourself. Mm -hmm. Because if you understood that everything is neutral and that it is truly an equally valid choice, 
then you wouldn't have any charge on it, as you say. Mm -hmm. You would know that it can't affect you because you're not accepting that, because you don't prefer it, so you can't be affected by it. So if you know that you can't be affected by something that someone may offer you that you perceive to be negative in energy, negative as a state of being, if you know it has nothing to do with you and know that it cannot be experienced by you just because you can observe it neutrally, then what reason do you have to judge it? What is the advice for people, um, say there's some people protesting, or not protesting, but uh, showing their hate for another type of person? Well, as I said, how do you respond to that? As I said. As a culture, as a group. You recognize that what they are expressing is hatred for some part of themselves. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. It's just that they're in denial about it. Remember that a person who is in denial is also in denial that they're in denial. Yes? Yeah. Therefore, they may have been brought up to believe that they are not worthy, unloved, undeserving. They may actually feel that they are in judgment of themselves, but they are afraid to look at that because they are afraid that if they do look at that, it will turn out to be true, that they're unworthy. So they will do everything to avoid looking at that within themselves, and that means they have to look outside themselves and project what they don't like about themselves onto others as convenient scapegoats. Mm -hmm. You follow? Yes. So if you understand that those people who hate others are in a sense in pain from hating themselves so much, you can have the compassion to help them start to find a way to look at themselves and heal themselves by understanding there are ways to validate themselves so they do not have to judge themselves negatively and therefore would have no reason to judge others in that way. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Is that helpful? In a sense, yeah. That, but? I mean, but, when you have... Yes? Group, like, I, I have, I'm not able to necessarily speak to these people, or people with who, that understanding aren't necessarily able to speak to these people, so... Why not? Or, well... Why not? They are, I guess, but just... Um, they are what? Sorry, I'm trying to formulate my question right. here. Um, yeah, I suppose I have these conversations with people and we, you know, do you allow, through that neutral standpoint, do you allow them to speak their mind? Because if you don't allow people to speak... You can really allow them anything because, again, you understand it doesn't really affect you. Now, it doesn't mean you excuse someone who is perpetrating something negative upon another or forcing themselves on another. But you can understand that dialogue and communication and helping them see themselves in a more positive light can work wonders and work miracles. There is actually, we believe, a story on your planet about an individual that you term an African American going around and actually speaking to members of an organization you call the Ku Klux Klan. Mm -hmm. And to this day, just because he is dialoguing with them and allowing them to understand him as a person, 200 or more of those individuals have given up their connection to that organization. Mm -hmm. It can be done. Right. You just have to understand what the mechanisms are that are at work and understand how to address the things that those people fear and hate about themselves. Yes? Mm -hmm. So it can be done. And that, I don't want to take too much more time, but... Oh, I, don't worry, can, I won't let you. <laughs> um, Th that then can filter down to sort of less important things maybe, uh, such as like people critiquing other people's art, for instance. Well, again, um, <laughs> you always have the ability to decide whether information given to you or a perspective given to you is advice that you could incorporate. It might teach you something. But the point is, is you have the ability to decide what is and isn't true. If you accept the idea of information or a particular viewpoint or perspective without a judgmental charge on it, then you can decide for yourself what is worthy in a sense or valuable to you to incorporate and what you need to leave behind that has nothing to do with you. But it's up to you to develop that discernment within yourself. Just because someone might critique you doesn't mean that it's necessarily applicable to you, but you get to decide whether it is or not. They don't get to decide that, you do. They're just right. offering you a point of view. If you react to it negatively, then in some senses, you actually are believing what they are saying to be true. So that might give you an opportunity to look within yourself if you get such a critique and decide whether you've been critiquing yourself too harshly or not. Right. Yes? Is that critiquing as a whole necessary for us as a 
for us. In a sense, yes, it can be because it can be used as a course corrector. Mm -hmm. Again, you won't always necessarily by yourself come up with every bit of information that you may require in life. Mm -hmm. That's why there are so many people. Everyone is a reflective mirror for everyone else. Right. That's what relationship is for. Mm -hmm. To give the people something, to offer them something that helps them become more of who they are. Sometimes people will do it negatively. Sometimes they will do it positively. Sometimes they may do it neutrally. But the point is, is if you don't have that reflection and you don't have that feedback, you may actually be missing out on a synchronicity that is giving you information you need. Even if the information they're giving you is not literally what you need, it may spark you to think of something you hadn't thought of before. So in that sense, it all has value whether you use what they literally said or not. Mm -hmm. Make sense? Yeah. It's about being imaginative, open, creative, mm -hmm. and willing to understand that nothing happens in your life without a reason. You get to decide how it applies and to what degree it applies, but if it's happening, it's happening for a reason. And when you stay in the state, the positive state of knowing that it must be there for a reason, even if it's something you don't prefer, mm -hmm. you stay in a positive state and use what you don't prefer in a way you do prefer, then you get the benefit out of it. If you use what you don't prefer in a way you don't prefer, you don't get the benefit. Make mm -hmm. sense? Yeah. Does this help? Yes, thank you. Well, thank you so much. Hello, Bashar. And you, good day. Good evening. Um, where to start on How this? How about at the beginning? <laughs> uh, many times you have spoken, and other people like Eckhart Tolle and other people who have talked about living in the now, the power of now. Yes. Living in the now. Yes, well, but that yet, really is all there is. Right. There is only now. Look at your watch. It's always now. Right. It's never then. I, I think, it's yeah, never I've will be. Dial it's always now. now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, in the words, I think, let me paraphrase, I think it was uh, yes. Mark Twain that said this. You know, he said, we've got kind of a conundrum here. He yes. says, plan for the future because without a doubt, the future is where you will spend the rest of your life. We understand the idea, we understand the sentiment, and Noah's saying you can't plan, but the idea is that your plan has to contain an opportunity for spontaneity too, because you have no idea what's actually going to happen. So continue to plan for the future, but live in the moment yes. and allow for spontaneity. Absolutely. Okay, there we go, thank you. Does that help? Yes. You're welcome. <laughs> Every plan should contain at least the possibility that the plan will fall apart. Hi, Bishop. And a you good day. Speak up, speak up. Use your technology. Hello. Um, so I was actually talking about you with uh, a friend last night, oh, and right. he didn't quite buy all of this. So well, he doesn't I, have to. Yeah. Well, so I asked. Well, I kind of encourage him to ask you questions. So here's one for you. Yeah. So well, he what he asked is like, okay, so if you guys exist, and given that you have such high and well such advanced technology, yes. So why haven't you? given us, well, like human beings, some solutions, processes, or formula to create like cleaner energy, for example, and like, yes. yeah, more environmentally yes. you know, friendly uh, material yes, 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 also. Yes, yes. Yep. We but have. We, we, do. we have. Oh, okay. But most of you don't do anything with it. Right. Can you, do you understand? So we give you enough, we give you a start, and we watch to see what you do with it. If you don't do much with it, what's the point of giving you more? Do you right. understand? Okay. We cannot yeah. just load the whole thing onto you. You wouldn't understand it. We have to take you through a process of evolving your understanding of the technologies. But we have actually shared the basic principles with many people on your planet, and we watch to see how far they take it. Okay. Yeah. Can, can you give me like an example? Just <laughs> yes. Some people have been very interested, some of your physicists, to understand how we use our spacecraft. And we have explained the idea of the principle of how we go from star to star very quickly. Now, moving more slowly, we can operate on different kinds of electromagnetic and gravitic wave technology, but going from star to star happens very differently. 
So we have explained that the principle, to keep this brief, is that you think of an object as existing in a location. We don't think it that way. We think that location is a property of the object. So if you change the locational variable in the energy equation of an object to another locational variable, the object has to stop existing at the first location and simply immediately start existing at the second location, not actually having traveled the intervening distance, just disappearing from one spot and appearing in another. The idea is that we have described an experiment to test this out for yourselves. The idea of taking something that has very little friction, <clears throat> very little mass, like a hollow conductive ball of steel, of copper, and putting it on a very flat table, as flat as you can make it, that is at least 10 feet long, putting it at one end, and with whatever technology you have, making it resonate to the point where you can read its entire energy equation. Then move it to the other end of the table, take another reading, and see if your technology is sensitive enough to tell the difference between those two frequencies, because there should be a difference. If you can measure the difference, then what you can do is put the object back in location A, and you can overwhelm it with a vibration of location B. It should start rolling down the table and stop at location B, thus proving the principle that we're talking about, how things will resonate to certain locational frequencies. We have described this experiment to several people on your planet. To date, no one has done it. So therefore, there is no point in giving you more information until you at least begin the basics. Right. But we are always willing to share. Although, on the other side, again, we will only go so far until we know that you are ready for more, because it would be the equivalent, let's say, of handing a child a nuclear weapon. I see. No offense. Okay. No problem. Thank you. Does um, that help? Yeah, sure. <clears throat> Can I ask Remember, you Remember. <laughs> Just as a relative understanding, our technology is about roughly 3,000 years ahead of you. Okay. We can't just download it all for you. You simply wouldn't understand it. Right. Yes? Yes. All okay. right. So we're happy to give you the basics and help you through the process. OK. Thank you. I'm um, sorry. Can I ask one more for myself? That was a question. <laughs> Would you like to ask another? Yeah, yes. <laughs> Yes, so I'm trying to follow your advice um, to follow my high ex excitement to the best right. I can and without any expectation. Yes. Um, what do you say about efficiency then? Efficiency? Yes. Well, that's automatically built in because when you act on your highest passion to the best that you are able, right. with no insistence or assumption as to what the outcome is supposed to look like, you start to activate the toolkit of excitement that contains the driving engine that moves you through life, it contains the organizing principle of synchronicity that actually brings you the things you need to do in the order in which you need to do them. You can't get more efficient than that. Okay. It's automatically built into the idea. That's why we say that when you do that and activate that kit, it's a complete kit and it leaves absolutely nothing out that is relevant for you in your life. It is the path of least resistance. And when you lower the resistance as much as you can, then you flow through life and again, you can't get more efficient than that. Does that help? Yes. Thank you so much. You're so welcome. No. <clears throat> Do we have a few more minutes? OK. Um, I'd like to ask, ask one question that the lady next to me started on. And that is, so... Wait a you, minute, wait a minute. What happened to, hello, good day. Oh, hello, good day. <laughs> and good day to you. <laughs> um, you mentioned that you have um, supplied or enlightened <clears throat> people on alternate energy technologies. Yes, we have and had discussions. Some people have posted some work on YouTube of some things that you have shared, but have they actually created energy, like lit a 100-watt light bulb or... Again, they are only at the beginning of such technology. They have noticed that there are certain energetic effects coming from some of the devices that they have been willing to create, but it's just the beginning. There are other things, other pieces of the puzzle they have yet to add to really get the final effects. Oh. But they are noticing that there are effects. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Hello, Bashar. And a you good day. Um, I have some questions about frequency. Yes. Um, the, the thing you were talking about with the, um, 
with each object having its own resonance and frequency? Yes. Would yes. that be like a, like a hertz number, like 140 It can hertz? be, but it's usually for a complex object, a harmonic. So a multitude of frequencies creating a harmonic. You have to record and analyze it to find the locational variable within the energy frequency equation. So how, with the technology, how would you figure out the frequency of an object by like I already a gave on you it? a description of the experiment. Okay. You have to have sensitive enough equipment to be able to tell the difference between the frequency of the object at one end of the table and the other end of the table. If you have equipment that is sensitive enough to tell them apart, then you're on your way. If you don't, you need to develop the technology further. Okay. That's the first step. You have to be able to read the frequency difference between what you believe to be the same object at one end of the table and the other. Because from our perspective, those are completely two different objects. Okay. Yes? Mm -hmm. All right. Um, and then the, my second question is, uh, one of the other channelers was talking about how the, um, the frequency or the radiation or the waves from cell phones isn't in tune with the... Uh, yes, Earth? it's usually a discordant frequency. Um, is there a way for us to <coughs> tune electronics better? There is. Your Tesla knew how. Okay. And the idea is there is a frequency that can actually bring all of the electronic waves on your planet into a single harmonic. It's based on what you call the Schumann resonance, the vibrational frequency of the Earth, which starts somewhere around what you call 7.85 hertz, but actually does go up and down a lot based on a lot of different variables. So if you can allow yourself to create a harmonic that is a harmonic of that Schumann resonance, as you call it, it can actually entrain all other electronic frequencies to go into that harmonic that is not then, at that point, harmful to your species, not discordant anymore. Okay, and that would be in addition or, or different technology than we're using right now? Yes. Okay. Although it can be an offshoot of what you're using, it's not necessarily that difficult. Again, your Tesla understood this you may wish to study his work. Okay, thanks. Will that do? Yes. All right, thank you. <laughs> Hello. And to you, good day. Yes. So, I don't really have a question, but you can make a statement. I can make some kind of query into something. A query is a question. Uh, I I recently uh, heard about uh, something called the delusion of grandeur. Yes. And uh, I have experienced this myself on uh, several occasions. Oh, all right. How some exciting! Yeah, sometimes, sometimes very, very exciting, and then uh, I get blasted back into reality, and it's like not, not that nice. All right. So, well, the phrase is usually representative of the negative ego expressing itself. The phrase is the negative ego expressing itself? Delusions of grandeur can mean many things in your society. It can have negative meaning, it can have positive meaning, or it can be used negatively or positively. In some senses, it is a way of sometimes reminding people that they might be getting ahead of themselves. Otherwise, it can be used to also suppress people. You have to have the discernment to understand how it's being used. Some people who are afraid of people excelling might say you're having delusions of grandeur just because you're attempting to go what they believe to be beyond your station in life, and you shouldn't be reaching for the stars. You should be happy just to reach the moon. So you have to be able to tell the difference between them when they're attempting to put you down, as opposed to when someone might actually be logically and wisely advising you that you might be thinking more highly of yourself than you need to be in a negative way. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. 
I have another uh, question about these uh, re recurring nightmares that I have about the uh, the ocean uh, and. Uh, oh, how exciting! Uh, yeah, it's very exciting. I, I was wondering if you had some uh, insight into like what that what that might be. It usually, not always, but it usually, in general, is a reflection of dealing with deep emotional issues. So Does that do ring I, a bell? How how can I deal with those a little more uh, efficiently or? Uh, well, are you experiencing the ideas of believing in lack of self-worth or lack of deservability? Uh, yeah. All right. Then that's a good place to start to understand that you have belief systems about yourself that is filtering your energy in a manner where you are creating a discounting energy of yourself. Is there something in life you would rather be doing? Something that is your dream, your passion that you're holding back from for some reason? Um, he probably, yeah. That I means would, yes. Yes. <laughs> what uh, would that be, or what might it be? It doesn't have to be the end-all, be-all, but can you name one thing that you would really, really be passionate and excited to do that you are not doing for some reason? For some belief system you have that something bad might happen if you do? Hmm. Or that you're not good enough, not worthy enough, or someone might reject you if you went in the direction of your truth? Any of those ringing a bell? Yeah, those are ringing little bells. All right, do they add up to one big bell? <laughs> the one, <laughs> the one big bell. All right. Uh, Is someone calling you a ding dong? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all, everybody call me a ding all dong. All right, well can you give us an example of what you're passionate about that you're not doing? Um, well, I'm doing like I, I I'm doing these things, but I I would like to be doing them like on uh, like a, th a thousand times uh, better. Yes, well, that's what we say. When you're doing your excitement, you have to do it in the most exciting way. If you're not really doing it in the most exciting way to the fullest that you can, you're not really doing your full excitement. So, what is holding you back in your belief system, in your definitions of yourself, and your definitions of life? What's holding you back from doing it? a thousand times more strongly. Uh, what are you know. afraid a, of, in other words? What yeah, are you afraid will fear. happen? There's a big fear, there's a big of, fear. Of? Hmm. Come on. Uh, Nothing to be afraid of to be afraid. Come on. I, I, What? What are you afraid will happen? You're among friends. I mean, I, I don't know, I mean, it, can't, it can't get much worse than, than like, Oh, you know, sure it can. Yeah. I, <laughs> I, Believe I mean, me, what's, what's you the are ultimate all fear? The very ultimate fear creative like at making things worse. <laughs> now, can you be I as guess creative things worse. at making them better? That's the question. What, what was that? Don't use your creativity to make things worse. That proves you are creative, so why not use your creativity to make things better for yourself instead of worse? The universe doesn't care which way you use the energy. Since you have proven to yourselves that you can make things worse, why not choose to use the same creativity to make things better? Yes? Yeah, that's, that's, that sounds good. So, what are you afraid? Just one little thing you're afraid might happen if you actually open up to being the you you prefer to be and doing the things you prefer to do in the way you prefer to do them. What's one little fear you have of something that might happen? Uh, Just one. I don't know. Oh, Maybe come like, on. Uh, yes, you do. I'd probably get too wild or something and kill too myself. Too wild and kill yourself. <laughs> Fascinating that you would equate the idea of having so much fun that you would kill yourself? <laughs> Potentially. Why would you kill yourself if you're having fun? Well, um, the tendency to like, There is uh, no medicate. tendency. There is no tendency. You see, this is what we're talking about. You have definitions that you're treating as if they're facts. You do not have a tendency, you are making a choice to believe in something. You're treating the idea of tendency as if it is a law of the universe. It's not. It's an opinion, it's a belief, it's a perspective, and that can be changed. Uh, I would love to change it. Then change it. You have to find out what it is first. Because you see, you all operate on a belief system. Whatever you believe to be true is what you do. Now, you can recognize that there may be things you would prefer to do that you're not doing, 
but the only reason you wouldn't do them is somehow in your motivational mechanism within your psychology, <clears throat> the only reason you wouldn't be acting on what really gives you joy is you must be defining it as something that wouldn't. That's why you would move away from it with all your power and all your strength. You have to find the definition that is coloring your excitement and making it seem darker than it is. When you find that definition that's coloring it, that's dampening it down, that's filtering it so you can't see the light in it that clearly, then you can let go of that definition because once you discover what that definition is that's out of alignment with your truth, you will see that it's nonsensical. It makes no sense. It's something you picked up on the way from your parents, your society, your friends, your school, someone, somewhere, fed you a belief that has nothing to do with you. It belongs to them. You're carrying around belief baggage that has nothing to do with you. Drop it. It doesn't belong to you. But you have to identify what that belief is in order to see how nonsensical it is to keep buying into it. So that's the process and that's the exercise. You ask the question in one of two ways. A, what would I have to believe is true about myself in this circumstance in order to feel what I'm feeling? Or B, as we already asked you, if I did act on my highest passion, what am I most terrified might happen? One way or the other, the answer, the definition will come to you if you're willing to receive it. And once you receive it, you will see there was actually nothing to be afraid of. It's just something you bought into and believed to be true, and that's what made it seem real. Because remember, physical reality is an illusion. The belief systems are simply designed to make you believe that it's real. That's how they operate. If belief systems didn't work to perpetuate themselves and make it seem real, you couldn't have a physical experience because physical reality isn't real. It's just a projection of consciousness. It's a shadow play. It's a projection on a wall. And the beliefs make it seem dimensional and solid. It's not. It's not. You get to choose what to believe is true within the parameters of the game that you're playing. But that is a lot of leeway. And you can decide that some definitions and some beliefs simply don't work for you and decide which ones do and move through life that way. Because again, you will never be contradicted by life itself. What you put out is what you get back. It may not always look like you think, it may not always look like you expect, but it will be there for a reason. And if you stay in a positive state with it and know that there must be a positive reason why something showed up, as we said earlier, even if it's something you don't objectively, neutrally prefer, it's there for a reason. And if you stay in the state of knowing that, you will always get the positive benefit from why that has shown up. If for nothing else, thank you, if for nothing else, that sometimes you will draw what you don't prefer as a contrast to more clearly understand by comparison what you do prefer. And that's how you use what you don't prefer in a preferable way. Make sense? Yeah. Does that help? No. <laughs> All right. That's your path. We will let you ponder it. Let it sink in. These are the way things work. This is how reality works from our perspective. But you have your own path. Thank you so much. Our unconditional love to you. Mine too. Thank you. And finally. Hey, Bashar. And a you good day. Um, I have a question. Does the choice become random if you allow yourself to present yourself with truly equal options? Or is it then when your true unbiased preference can shine forth? Well, yes, and there's a little bit of both in that because you understand that synchronicity on your planet can allow for a number of different kinds of paths to serve the same purpose or the same function. So unless there is some reason why you really need a specific thing to happen in a specific way, most of you are satisfied enough by simply putting out the energy of the theme you're exploring and allowing any number of things to show up seemingly randomly that will work for you 
in a certain way, and as long as that certain way is fulfilled, it doesn't really matter whether you choose A, B, C, or D. Does that make sense? Yes. Does that answer the question? It does, thank you. Is that it? I would have another question yes? for uh, someone from the audience. All right, well, we'll see. He asked we'll me see. to ask, um, how advanced are like, the propulsion technology on Earth at the moment that is hidden from the public? It is capable of manipulating electromagnetic and gravity waves to a certain extent. But it's not as far along as many people suppose. It's not as controllable by certain people as many people suppose. Nevertheless, it is farther along than you've been told. Not sure how to give you an order of magnitude. Does that help? I guess. <laughs> All right, well, in other words, there are crafts that have been created by humans on your planet that do exhibit some of the traits that you assign to some of our craft, but they're, let's just say, to use your own vernacular, the Model T version <laughs> compared to our craft, but they still do remarkable things. Does that help? Yes. But? No, but. All right. <laughs> oh, I just heard from the audience. Are they, are they trans transdimensional? Yeah. Yeah, right. They can be, but it's not really fully controlled at this time. And therefore, there have been what you would call a few unintended events. <laughs> therefore, it's not really completely under your guidance yet. And besides, certain things won't be allowed because they impinge on other realities that you have no business impinging on? Does that make sense? Yep. So until you learn to do what you're doing in a more beneficial way, some of the technologies that you may actually have access to are not actually allowed to go as far as they could, and many of the people working on those technologies actually don't realize that some of that information is being withheld from them in much the same way that they might be withholding information from the general population of your planet. <laughs> But we won't go deeply into that now. <clears throat> so thank you. Thank you. At this timing, we will once again express our deep appreciation and deep gratitude at the opportunity to open up this bridge and connection between our respective civilizations and allowing us to perceive through each and every one of you that many more facets of the multidimensional crystal of creation which expands our understanding of all that all that is can be. Our unconditional love to you all, and we bid you all an exciting life of exploration and discovery, and perhaps even more importantly, play. Enjoy your life, that's what it's for. Good day.